Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 7 today, so grab your Bible, open it up to Deuteronomy chapter 7. We begin in just one minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out when you get a chance. If you're hungry for the Word of God, if you love the Word of God, that's the place to go because you can study the entire Bible verse by verse using my audio Bible commentaries from Genesis through Revelation in the order that you want to do it. I always suggest beginning in Genesis, though, and going through the entire Bible. That's a great project. That's a great spiritual exercise and a great spiritual project for you to go through the whole Bible because it's all important. And you can do that at your pace, at your convenience, at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 7, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. When the Lord your God shall bring you into the land where you go to possess it, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. And that's because they were so wicked. It had reached the place where there was nothing left except complete annihilation. You know, God would be arrested and charged and convicted of a hate crime if he was in America today. I guess it never occurred to God that he needed to be tolerant with those who revel in their lewd lifestyle. He wanted, he wanted them off the face of the earth. They would corrupt his people in more than one way. And by the way, just so you know, God gave these people 430 years to repent. Now, if that's not enough time for you, 430 years to repent. If that's not long enough as far as you're concerned, then I have nothing more to say to you and neither does God, I'm sure, except repent yourself. 430 years to repent, but they refused. So now, don't waste your breath trying to tell me how unfair God is to do this. Verse 3. Neither shall you make marriages with them. Your daughter you shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shall you take unto your son. For they will turn away your son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. See, they were, they were I mean, after 430 years, Obviously, they were completely, totally given over to their sin. And by the way, at least with some of them, the Nephilim gene was present. So not only were they corrupt spiritually, they were corrupt physically as well. But anyway, they certainly were given over to their sin. Their hearts were as hard as a rock. They were not going to repent. They would not be influenced by the holiness of the Israelites, but the holiness of the Israelites would be influenced by their wickedness. And that would become a problem. You know, evil is like yeast. Because a, a little dab quickly spreads. And it corrupts everything. Marrying someone who isn't sold out to God, marrying someone who isn't sold out to Jesus Christ is like putting a chunk of spiritual yeast in your soul. It's going to be nothing but trouble. 
Let's read verse 4 again. For they will turn away your son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. And God says, Israel, I'm warning you in advance. Because if you corrupt yourself, I'm going to punish you just like I'm going to punish them. See, God is no respecter of persons. There are a lot of people today who call themselves evangelical, Bible-believing Christians, but they are lukewarm at best. And for whatever reason, they think that they have a license to sin because they're under grace. You do not have a license to sin. And if that's what you're thinking is, you're not even saved. Don't kid yourself. Don't fall into a spiritual stupor. Or God will wake you up with a two-by-four across the head and you'll never see it coming. Verse 5. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. And don't compromise. Don't compromise, don't tolerate, and there can be no compromise with sin today. Destroy it utterly out of your life. Remove all temptations to sin to the best of your ability. Get rid of it. Clean house. Get rid of anything that will drag you down. Latch on to anything that will draw you closer to Jesus. Anything that would arouse the slightest temptation was to be cut down and destroyed. Everything that would in any way make them even curious about evil was to be cut down, burned, and destroyed. Jesus said it this way, if your right arm offends you, cut it off. If your right eye offends you, causes you to sin, gouge it out. He's not talking about removing parts of your body. He's saying get radical. Don't just get rid of sin, but get rid of the thing that causes sin. And that's what he's telling the Israelites to do right here. Don't play around with it. Don't walk close to the borderline between sin and righteousness. Verse 6. For you are an holy people unto the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a special people unto himself above all people who are upon the face of the whole earth. And the word chosen means to be chosen, of course, to do something for God and to be something for God. Israel was chosen to be holy. Israel was chosen to make a statement to the heathen of the world that there is a real God and this is what he is like. And the Israelites were to reflect God's holy character so that the lost world, everyone other than Israel, by the way, who was into idolatry and all sorts of immorality would see that there is a right way and there is a true God. And Israel has him. They were to be a testimony. And as I said a couple of broadcasts ago, you can't be a testimony to God if you're not living holy. You're useless to him if you're not living holy. Verse 7, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were fewest of all people. I mean, if you want to go back to the very beginning, it boils down to this. It was Abraham and Sarah. Two people, two old people, beyond the age of childbearing. And God, out of them, promised a nation. He didn't choose the Israelites because they were many. He didn't, he didn't look for the for the country that had the largest population or the greatest military, military and say, you know, I'm going to make you my chosen people. I'm pretty impressed with you. No, he started with two old people. Abraham, beyond the, beyond the time when he could father a child, and Sarah never could father or be the mother of a child. She was barren. Both of them old. And that's who he chose. He chose Sarah and Abraham. 
to bring about his people. And so no Israelite was to look in the mirror and say, man, you're irresistible. No wonder God chose you. Israel didn't deserve a thing. They were merely the object of God's grace. Verse 8. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, and that's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God's love is not motivated. Watch this. Watch this. Because some of you need to be corrected in your thinking concerning this. I need to be reminded of this. Quite often, here it is, God's love is not motivated by any goodness in the object of his love. God's love is not motivated by any beauty in the object of his love. God just chooses to love, so he loves. God is love. That's the essence of his character. He is love. He doesn't love you because you've, you're worthy. People say, oh, God, I don't know how you can love me now that I've committed this sin. Well, I don't know how he could have loved you um, before you committed that sin. What, what has changed? You're, you weren't any lovable before than what you are now. What does that have to do with anything? He loves you because it's his nature to love, not because you're lovable. That's one thing we need to understand. So, oh, you just ruined my self-esteem. Good. You don't have anything in you to esteem. Not according to God's words, you don't. Yeah, but, but I must be lovable. Otherwise, God, God wouldn't love me. No, you don't understand it. God loves you because it's his nature to love. Not because you're lovable. You are his enemy before you get saved. You have done abominable things in his eyes. You've, your sin has offended him more than you can possibly imagine. You're not lovable to him. He loves you because it's his nature to love. And you need to understand that so that he gets the credit and not you. You say, well, I don't like you anymore, Moret. Well, I guess if I have to lie and exalt you above God in order to get you to like me, it's not worth it. Just accept it. It is the way it is. God chose Israel because he loved him. And he loved them because he loved them. You know why he loved Israel? Because he loved them. You know why he loves you? Because he loves you. And he chose, he chose them too because he promised their ancestors that he would. And God never goes back on his word. Don't you just love that about God? You, you know where he stands. He never changes. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. A thousand generations doesn't mean one more than 999 generations. It's not talking literally here. And I'm a literalist, but it's not. It just simply means forever. The word thousand oftentimes is used figuratively in Scripture. But God kept his promise to Abraham because he never goes back on his word. Verse 10. And repays them who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. So Israel is warned again and again against obedience, against sin. Because you know, when you tolerate sin in your life, you eventually get to the place where you despise God. I mean, you hate Him. And you never would dream that it would ever get to that, but it's true. 
Verse 11, you shall therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command you this day to do them. So yes, Israel is God's chosen nation, no question about it. But that sure doesn't give anyone in that nation a license to go wild in sin, and that was God's warning to them. God says, if you hate me, I'm going to deal with you, and I'm going to deal with your sin, and you can count on that. And we show hatred for God by sinning against him. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Verse 12. Wherefore, it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God shall keep unto you the covenant and the mercy which he swore unto your fathers. God would never look for a loophole in the covenant so that he could get out of it. His covenant with Israel is forever. But the Israelites could lose the blessings of that covenant if they choose to rebel, which eventually they did time after time, culminating in rebellion against the Son of God himself when they demanded that he be killed. And yeah, they're a nation today as I make this broadcast, but they're not the people of God today. Sorry, they're not. They are not the people of God today. Individual Jews who repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior become a part of the people of God because there's only one people of God, and that's the church. Israelites, Gentiles, anybody from anywhere becomes a member of God's family when they receive Christ as Lord and Savior. It doesn't matter what kind of blood you got going through your vein. You say, I got Hebrew blood flowing through my vein. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a member of God's family. I'm one of God's chosen people. No, you are not. You are in rebellion against God if you reject Christ. Verse 13. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land your corn and your wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the flocks of your sheep in the land which he swore unto your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and he will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which you know upon you but will lay them upon all them who hate you. These, these blessings are conditional. The condition is obedience. They're tremendous blessings. And you could bet God would keep his promise. So if Israel obeys, they're going to experience fertility. In other words, good things are going to multiply. All good things are going to multiply. And bad things will just fall by the wayside. Things that bring joy will increase. Things that bring sadness will decrease. They're not going to be. If they're not like all the other people in the world, then they will not be experiencing the trouble that all the people in the world experience. If they're not like all the other people in the world who know not God, then they won't be like all the other people in the world. And it's the same with us Christians today. If you as a Christian are not like the people of the world in your behavior and your attitude, then you're not going to be like the people of the world when it comes to blessing and joy and peace and whatever else God wants to give you. Verse 16. And you shall consume all the people which the Lord your God shall deliver you. Your eyes shall have no pity upon them. Neither shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto you. Don't let the world be a snare unto you. It's a trap. 
You say, but I'm a Christian. It doesn't matter. The world is still out there threatening to be a snare unto you. If you get too close to it, if you start to love the world, if you become too interested in the world's ways, it will become a snare unto you. As for the Israelites, the moment they started feeling sorry for those vile, impenitent sinners, they needed to shift gear in their minds and start thinking about something else. Don't even go there. Don't cuddle up to these miserable, rotten sinners. And you and I cannot cuddle up in any way to the things of the world, to the sinful things of this world. But as for the Israelites, sentimentalism, feelings, wasn't to govern their treatment of the Canaanites. Or one thing would lead to another. And before you know it, the Israelites themselves would be ruined. You might, you might see a, a cute little puppy but if he's infected with rabies, you better not be sentimental and try to pet him, or he'll bite you and you'll die. Verse 17. If you shall say in your heart, these nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but, but shall well remember what the Lord your God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. The great temptations which your eyes saw and the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the stretched out arm whereby the Lord your God brought you out, so shall the Lord your God do unto all the people of whom you are afraid. And God is saying you don't have to be afraid. If you are afraid, if you are intimidated, don't go with it. Overcome, rise above your feelings and trust in the Word of God. You know, Moses knew these people like the back of his hand. He had been their leader for 40 years. He knew what they were like. He knew they were inclined to focus on obstacles instead of the God who's running this show. And when you start focusing on obstacles, you're going to start to panic. God doesn't want us to concentrate on the bigness of our problems. He wants us to concentrate on the greatness of the Lord our God. Because he's bigger than any problem. 20. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until they who are left and hide themselves from you be destroyed. Isn't that neat? I just love how God has all creation at his disposal and he can use anything he wants to use anytime he wants to use it to bring about his perfect will, to work on behalf of his people and to work against his enemies. Nothing is too difficult for God. He can do anything he wants to do any way he wants to do it by any means he wants to use. Never limit God. So God will cause Israel's enemies to run and panic as if they were being attacked by a swarm of hornets. And, and maybe, they, maybe they were. I don't know. I, I don't have any reason not to take this literally. I remember when I was real little, there's a big, I mean, I was probably about six years old. <clears throat> we used to have this woods behind our house and all the, you know, 30, 35 kids in our little one block neighborhood would, would a lot of times play down there. And there's one big guy, he's a good guy, he's probably about four years older than me. I remember one time we were going, him and me and several other people, we were going down, um, there was a slope into this woods right behind our house. And this guy, his name was Tom, he, he stepped on a beehive or something, and anyway, he got tangled up in a, in a beehive. 
And man, they started attacking him. And I could still hear him. So how long ago was this? You know, 57 years ago. I can still hear him. I can still see him uh, swinging his arms and repeating, owie, 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 owie. Uh, they, must have been, they must have been biting him and stinging him. Owie, 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 owie. And he was just flinging his arms all over the place. He was so occupied doing that, you could have done anything to him at that point, and he wouldn't be able to fight you back. It's hard to, it's hard to hide from a hornet, and it's hard to do anything when you're being attacked by bees. And, and that's God's point here. He's going to have these enemies of his and enemies of his people so occupied being chased by hornets that they're, they're going to be defenseless when it comes to fighting against the Israelites. Verse 21. <clears throat> you shall not be affrighted at them. For the Lord your God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. That means terrifying, awe-inspiring. Verse 22. And the Lord your God will put out those nations before you by little and little. You may not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon you. Well, that, that's kind of interesting. Notice how, how God knows what to do and when to do it, and how fast to do it, too. God would drive out the enemies. He said he would, but not in a haphazard, ill-conceived flurry of mindless attacks. That's not how God operates. God always operates in a systematic, carefully thought-out manner which is best for his children. So you can try to rush God and you get frustrated with God because he's not doing something fast enough to you, but you're just wasting your time. Why don't you just sit back and live for Jesus and make sure you're putting him first and make sure you're praying, make sure you're worshiping, make sure you're in the word of God, make sure you have the mind of Christ, make sure you're closer to him than ever and just put your trust in him. Not, in what he, not just in what he's doing, but in the timing. Verse uh, 23, But the Lord your God shall deliver them unto you and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. So it would take a while, and it would require some patience on behalf of the Israelites, but God would bring in the victory. Verse 24, And he shall deliver their kings into your hand, and you shall destroy their name from under heaven, and there shall no man be able to stand before you until you have destroyed them. God's plan would go forward, no doubt about it, and no one would stop Israel until that plan was accomplished. And here's the lesson for us. When the heat is on, when the pressure is on, it's good to remember that you can't lose if you don't quit on God. Just hang in there, be patient, persevere, walk with Jesus, and the victory will come. 25. The graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. You shall not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto you, lest you be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Neither shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be cursed, lest you be a cursed thing like it. But you shall utterly detest it, and you shall utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. So when the Israelites are fighting against these Canaanites, you know, so after they destroy them, some of that plunder and some of those goods that are left behind, it's going to look mighty appealing to Israel. But they were to exercise self-discipline, self-control, and get rid of it all. Don't bring it into your house. Don't take it unto yourself. Because it will turn out to be a trap. A trap for sin. So, very important that we don't allow things into our life, into our homes, that can become a trap to sin. It may be enticing. It may be something that we think would be enjoyable. It may be something good to look at. Don't go there. Don't bring anything into your home. Don't allow anything into your life that will become a snare and lead to sin or could possibly lead to sin. 
We'll pick it up in chapter 8 next time. Just a reminder that you can study the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible commentaries at our website, which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, please remember that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. And you can give in a secure method if the Lord leads you at thebibleversebyverse.com by clicking the donate button at the top of the front page. Or you can write scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. That's scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, zip code 53074. Until next time, Michael Moret for scripture verse by verse. So long, everyone.